we're, we're going we're gonna to preach a message to you called Relationships on the Rock. Relationships on the Rock. Can you help me welcome Alex and Laura Russo as they come out to the stage? How y'all doing? How y'all Good. doing? Good. Good to How see you guys. Doing? Come on, make some noise for these lovely people. Amazing. Um, how y'all? How you guys doing? How you guys been? We've been good. Yeah. You good. doing well? Yeah, really things good. are good. Is your marriage okay? Things are going good. That. Well, after that game, I'm questioning things. A yeah, little seriously. Bit. To be fair, the Russos do not have favorites. We like a plethora of things. Yes. So. All right. Okay. Star Wars is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, you like to be like expansive. Yeah, you don't I don't just like be... to commit to like a hard. This is my favorite movie. Yeah. But I do yeah. not like Lord of the Rings. He hates so it. So hey, that's probably why I yeah. wrote Star Wars. Hey, can we shout out to Natalie and Clark real quick? Yeah, I'm impressed, guys. Um, I do want to say the fact that they wrote Star Wars when there's how many movies? There's not nine movies, right? There's nine of them, people. The Get more specific. Piece, yeah. Where's Natalie and Clark? Where, where are you at? Get more specific. I'm just kidding. I love you guys. I'm so proud of you. you guys, seems like you guys have a future here. It's really cool. Um, kind of a joke. No one laughed. It was really awkward. I laughed inside. Um, so, hey, um, I'm excited about, how, how, have, you, have you guys been enjoying this, the relationship series? Yeah, it's been good. I, I love how we've been doing this every year around the clock. Yeah. It's almost like the people who have been here for the past three years are like, here it comes again. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but it's always yeah. good. It's, yeah. it's always good. Yeah. I, actually, people have been telling me, they're like, oh my gosh, I love this series. And I'm like, is it because I say the word sex on stage a lot? <laughs> and they're like, um, I don't know. Let me run away. And I'm like, Okay. Um, let's, we all know the, the real answer. Okay. Um, hey, so again, we're, we're, we're preaching a message together. We're each going to take a point and, and we're going to preach one message together. I'm, I'm pumped about this. Um, it's called Relationships on the Rock. And the first preacher in the building is Laura Russo. Come on, Come make on. some noise for Laura as she steps up to preach the word to us. Awesome. On. Relationships on the Rock. All right, guys, I'm going to need to get some feedback from you, okay? Because as you know, I'm Latina, so if I hear you shouting, I have to be louder. Um, so thank you, Catherine. Yeah, okay. So my first point is get it right. I am so excited to be able to talk to you guys about dating and being able to prepare yourself for a relationship. This is important. This is the first step, and this is where you can either make it or break it. So I want you to know three things. Number one, I want you to know yourself. If you are in the market and you're getting ready to date, you should know yourself very well. Well, you might say to me, well, I obviously know myself. I was born myself and I am myself every single day. But at this age, at this time in your life, so many things change. So many um, new, new beginnings start for you, new jobs, new schools, new everything. It is so important that in these formative years, you truly ground yourself and know who you are know what you believe in, know what your hard yes and no's are. So for me, you know, I have a hard yes on certain things and a hard no. Now, if I'm starting a relationship and all of the things that I know about myself don't add up with this person that I'm evaluating, well, then that's going to be a hard no because it's not going to work. We're not going to be on the same page. We're not going to be equally yoked. So you need to know yourself. Now, one thing I know is, first of all, you're probably like, well, who are you to tell me anything? You're married and you've been in a relationship forever. Well, let me tell you my credentials, okay? I was a serial dater, okay? I used to date too many people, okay? It was not good. This was in my wayward years. I was not a Christian. And um, I can tell you that I've been in all types of relationships and most of them if not all of them, were terrible because I didn't know who I was. I was just dating to find someone else. I wasn't dating to find the other half for me. I was dating because I was just lonely and I wanted to have that companionship. Now, because of that, every single person that I dated, I started to become more like them. And I didn't know myself enough to not take on their persona a little bit. And that's what happens when you date. You step into this path, you step into this area where you're like, oh, I really love how this person's a skater guy. I'm going to be a little bit more punky now. Or I, this guy, he's, you know, he's got my heart. He's all business. I'm going to dress in J. Crew. Um, over here, oh, you know what? I love this guy. He's got a little bit of thug in him. So I'm... <laughs> yeah, that was not Alex. 
Thank you, Jesus. Alex, the thug. <laughs> the thug is long gone. <laughs> um, but what happens is when you date over and over again in these, you know, serious relationships, because you don't know yourself well, you start taking on these habits and these attributes of other people. And that can be a very dangerous place. If you're not dating and evaluating with people who are Christian, who are good, who are just fundamentally want the best for you, then you're going to be in a relationship with someone who's just trying to take and take and take and you give because that's what you want. You want to be able to give and you want to output, but at the end of the day, it's only depleting you. So know yourself. Devout, devout yourself to, to the Lord. Be 100% fully focused on God. You have to be able to know that you're in a solid relationship with God before you can be in a relationship that's going to be healthy. And I'll tell you right now, I took a year before I started dating. I said, the Lord spoke to me, said, stop dating. You need to figure things out. And in that year, God spoke to me like never before. And I would not give that season of singleness up for anything because that prepared me to be the person to meet Alex and know that this is a godly man. This is a man who cares about me and that we were able to have such a fruitful relationship. And one thing I also want to say is know yourself and what your um, what your aspirations are in life. Don't aspire to be in a relationship. Aspire and dream and, and just have wonder and awe for what your life can offer for you. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to go into the industry? Do you want to go into ministry? Do you want to go into the free market? Whatever you want to do, have a plan ready and think about it. Don't just think about what you want to do in a relationship or first I'm going to be a relationship, then I'll get a job and then I'll do this. No, get your plan together. Next, know them. Who are their friends? Look at their friends and say, are these people that I think are actually godly, awesome people that I want to surround myself with? Or do you go and hang out with their friends and be like, oh man, I don't want to hang out with them again. Um, next is what's their relationship with God like? Because you need to be dating someone who loves God more than they love you. That their 100% focus is on God and not you. If their focus is 100% on you, you've got a problem. Because at some point, you will fail. They will fail. And when that happens, what's left? See, when I fall and when I fail, which is all the time, I don't say... Alex doesn't look at me and say, well, you failed, and I put all my eggs in the basket, and now you know, I don't want to be with you anymore. He says, no, let's look to the Lord, and we'll, we'll get through this together. Because our, our focus is always on God. It's always on God and then the relationship. Um, you know, do you question your motives with them ever? Now, this is especially true if you're dating someone who's you know, not a full Christian or they go to church sometimes. Do you ever question where you stand with them? I'll tell you right now, get out of that relationship because you should never question where you stand with someone. You should know what their intentions are right off the bat. You should never be standing on shaky grounds, just like the verse that we're going to go through. Don't stand on shaking ground. Um, and finally, know the creator. This is the most important, guys. You have to know who Jesus is before you can fully love someone and fully be able to get into a serious relationship. If I didn't have Jesus in my relationship, I'm telling you right now, we would be divorced. I'm not even like saying that in a way that's like trying to be, you know, like get your attention. I would have divorced him because I'm a selfish person. And if I didn't have the Lord speaking to me every single day, and in the times when we have struggled in our relationship, because I'll, guess what? It's not all sunshine. There are going to be days where you see the worst of the worst of the worst. And if I didn't know God, then we wouldn't be standing here. We wouldn't be in ministry together. We would be in completely separate areas. You have to know God and you have to know how good he is, how much he loves you, how much he sacrificed for you. Because when you know that, you have grace and mercy and you pour out into those around you and you are selfless and all you care about is just the will of God. So when you're having a tough day and your spouse comes home or your, your boyfriend comes over and they're in a mood, instead of being selfish and saying, oh man, like I'm so tired of your attitude. Instead, you say, how can we pray through this? What can we do? Like, let's seek the Lord. Let's do this together. And it will make for such a strong and fruitful, beautiful, beautiful relationship. Don't settle. Dating, do not settle. Get it right. Get it right. So now you know how to date. What's next, Alex? Wow. Amen. Wow. That was good. 
So my point, building off of this idea of building a relationship on the rock. So if we could throw my point up on the screen, it is to get ready. We got a lot of questions. I know we asked you to send in questions. We got a lot of questions. Of when, it, when is it ready to get engaged? When am I ready to get married? When am I ready to take that next step in commitment? We got a lot of questions like that. So I hope to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that. And please know that a lot of these points that I'm about to bring forward don't necessarily only apply to marriage. They can apply to other areas as well. But the, the, the verse that I have is Proverbs 19.2. Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste, his feet misses his way. So in other words, the, 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 it's saying desire without knowledge, don't rush into things. Paul echoes this in Romans chapter 10 where he says, you have zeal without knowledge, he's rebuking the, the Israelites, meaning that you may have passion, you may have excitement, you may have energy, but here's the thing, it's, it's lacking knowledge. And when you rush into something without knowledge, or you are passionate on fire with, on something for knowledge, it can often lead to destruction, or can lead to failure, or can lead to going down the wrong pathway. So you wouldn't build a house on a foundation in haste. You wouldn't quickly put together a house, and you, know, you wouldn't rush it together. It's like when you have a group project, and you're putting everything together at the last minute, and you're just, you knew that you waited the very last day. Your teacher gave you two weeks to do it, but of course you waited until the day before, and you're scrambling to throw things together. You're running to the dollar store trying to find everything you can, and then you get to, the, get to present the project, and it's like it's total trash. It's because you, you did it with haste. You did it quickly. And oftentimes, in the same way of building a house, if you rush into engagement or rush into marriage with haste, oftentimes it can set you up for a very shaky and rocky marriage. So a few things um, to test whether you're ready to get married. I have three questions. So the first question is, are you emotionally ready? Are you emotionally ready? So a big part of this, and there are some things that you can test to make sure that you, you fall within this criteria, is, is test, your test your motivations for why you want to get married. I want to just make this clear, and I'm going to point to it again at the end. Marriage should be there to help to send you and embrace your relationship with God. Marriage should be there to help to expedite and to elevate your calling in, in, in this world. It should be there to not diminish or to distract, but to help to amplify your relationship with God. So all of the things that I'm saying are related to that. And I know it can be enticing to get married or engaged simply because everybody else around you is doing the same thing. You may look around and see all the people that are your, your same age, you graduated with you, they're getting married, they're having kids, they're buying houses, and it can be so enticing to jump into a marriage just because you want that same thing, you want that same affirmation, you want what feels right and what seems right. But the reality is if, if you are getting motivated because of what other people are doing, you may not be emotionally ready. And the other big one is that, here it is, sex. So if you are trying to get married simply because you want to have sex, and you want to do it God's way, and you want to jump in just so you can have sex, you might want to check your motivations there. Because if you're jumping into a marriage simply to fulfill a lustful expectation or fill the lustful desires in your heart, you may be setting yourself up for a marriage that's not focused on love and unconditional covenant, but more of how can I fill my immediate needs? And if you're going into a marriage with the expectation that you're getting your needs met, it can be very, it can set you up for a very uncomfortable marriage and a lot of, of, of challenges down the road. Um, another big one is the note that marriage really combines the emotional burdens of two people. And I'm going to be quite frank with you. You know, you carry on the mental health challenges, the fears, the uncertainties, the financial problems, whatever it might be that that other person is walking with, as soon as you get married, you take on all of those burdens. So if you're not prepared to take on the burdens of somebody else, if you're maybe struggling in your own walk and you're saying, how could I take on the burdens of somebody else? Know that when, when your spouse comes home after a long day or it's, it's, it's been challenging, you're going through a season, maybe there's something going on, even your marriage is good, but maybe your spouse's family is going through a difficult time, you take that burden on. 
So this is something that you have to be aware of that. Are you emotionally ready to take on the emotional burdens and challenges of, of the other person? So the second point is, are you financially ready? Now, I'm not saying that you have to have everything perfect before you get married, you know, especially if you're young. I'm not saying you have to have everything lined up. You have to have a 401k and you have to have X amount in bank. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that marriage comes with an expectation that, that there, it, it, is a, it, it is financially challenging for a lot of couples. And in, in Scripture, money and possessions are the second most referenced topic in all of the Bible. And not only that, 11 of, of Jesus' 39 parables reference finances or money. So from the Christian perspective, from the Christian walk, clearly finances and money are very important. So it's not just in talking about marriage here, but being financially responsible and financially uh, healthy is important throughout your whole life. But going into a marriage, remember that, as Caleb said a couple weeks ago, Marriage never diminishes your problems. It often amplifies your problems. So if you have financial problems as, as you're single and you go into a marriage, those, they're not going to go away. They're not going to be solved. Sometimes those financial problems will get even, even worse. And note this, is that when you get married, the two become one. Literally, the two become one. As, as it's, a, it's a spiritual, you know, two souls become one. But beyond that, your finances become their finances. So her student loans become your student loans. His, his car loans become your car loans. His credit card debt becomes your credit card debt. So it's not simply a matter of just, you know, oh, well, we're going to get married. Have these things thought out and say, well, are we going to set ourselves up for financial success? Because I can tell you why. If you look at the divorce rates, if you look at things going on, Financial problems are one of the biggest areas why people get divorced. And you don't want to start yourself off in, in your marriage with, with, fine, with fighting over financial things every single week. And this is just a big, this is just some, something practical for those who are not yet married. One of the best ways you can start off your marriage is not being in debt. And what do I mean by that? Is you have to make a decision when you get married or where, where you're going to live. Are you going to live with your parents? Are you going to live on your own and go rent? Or are you going to put a down payment on a house? And there are a lot of different factors going on here. I understand that. But sometimes you have to wonder, are you focusing on the wedding or are you focusing on the marriage? And what do I mean by that is sometimes people put so much em emphasis and energy on the wedding day. $5,000 wedding dress, ice sculptures, five photographers, videographers, you know, you know, a... Boston uh, honeymoon, whatever it might be, and they, by, by the end of the day, you know that you've spent thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on this one wedding day, and a lot of couples look back and wonder, was that really, was that really the purpose of, of the wedding? But really, a wedding is a public declaration of a covenant between a man and a woman, and making it, and presenting that in front of their family and friends. You know, that's truly what it is. And our culture has made an expectation that weddings have to be glamorous and, uh, you know, over the top. But the truth is, if you look at, if you look at that, is that, is that a healthy way to start off your marriage in, with that much money? Or could you take that money, that forty, fifty thousand dollars that you spent on that wedding, and put it towards a down payment on a house? You could then set yourself up for financial strength. I'm just being real here. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I'm, am, am I? Is this good? Is this good? So just. Just think about these things as you're heading into, are you ready? Uh, and then the, the final one, I know Caleb is going to unpack this a little bit deeper. Are you eternally ready? Here's, here's something that you should know. You're not married in heaven. I know. And that's not me, that's Jesus. You can take it up with him. Uh, the, the, the reality is, is that you're not married in heaven. When, when you die, Jesus says you're like the angels. You know, you're no, you're, you're no longer bound in, on earth as, a, as you are in heaven, so you're no longer married in heaven. So one thing to note is this, is that when you are thinking about marriage, you should be thinking it uh, from an eternal perspective and knowing that your marriage on earth is temporary, just as all, everything on this earth is temporary. So what should you be doing with this time? You should be stewarding this time on earth for your calling in the kingdom of God. And what's our calling primarily? It's to know God 
and to help others know God as well. And if your spouse and the person you're looking for is not advancing that, amplifying it, spurring you on, then, then, what, then what, 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 are you, what is your outcome? What is your ultimate purpose here? So think about this from an eternal perspective. Is your spouse helping you to build that firm foundation? Are they helping you to advance your calling? Are they spurring you on to be a better, stronger Christian? Are they helping you and advancing you in your mission? Because that's ultimately, it's an eternal focus. It's not focused on, you know, you know marriage is a, is a great blessing, but it's temporary. It's temporary. And it should be here to help us and advance us for the kingdom of God. Amen? So good. Come on, give it up for Alex and Laura tonight. Thank you guys so much. Um, what a word, what a word. Somebody, somebody say, get right. Someone say, get ready. Now, someone shout back at me, get on the rock. Get on the rock. I want to read the text that's informing our message tonight. It's Matthew 7, 24 through 27. It says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Look what happens. Next verse. The rain, come, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation. Someone shout foundation. It had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. <laughs> Look what happens if you build your house on sand. If we're going to get that next verse, I'll read it to you out loud. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And, and it fell, the Bible says, with a great crash. Father, speak to us for the remainder of this message. I thank you so much for what you've already spoken. That help us to kind of close this message with the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus is, is teaching his disciples, and he's contrasting a wise man who builds his house on a rock with a foolish man who builds his house on sand. And he's saying that the wise man that builds his house on the rock Man, storms come, rains fall, winds blow, and that house is going to stand. But contrastly, the, the house that's built on sand, he's like, man, that guy's a foolish guy. And, and if you build your house on, a, on, on the sand, what's going to happen is storms are going to come, rains are going to fall, winds are going to blow, and that, that house, that's going to fall. Like, it's not going to last. It will not last. I remember being at the beach with um, a, a group of our friends and Stacey and I, we took the kids to Newport Beach, uh, one of the beaches, in Newport, Rhode Island, one of the beaches at Newport, Rhode Island. And we were there with some friends and we're having a good time. And Lena is, is all over the beach. She's owning the beach. At that point, she was like a, she was two years old or something like that. And so she, she was running around and, and getting into people. She, uh, she was running into people's circles and stuff. And I kept having to say, hey, let's stay with our group. And, and so she, she, she starts, I think, with her uncle Seth. Shout out to Seth in the room. I think she, they, they started to build some sandcastles. And so she, she was taking the, the sandcastle tool is that what it's called, a tool? And packing the sand in and then putting it on the sand and then taking it off and seeing the big, beautiful sand castle. And she's, she's building the sand castles. But, but what she liked even more about building the sand castle was destroying the sand castle. So, so she was building them as fast, we were building them as fast as she, we could, and then she would come over and kick them down and punch them down and take the shovel and hit them over. And, and here's what I learned that day about sand castles. Sand castles are easy to build, but they're also easy to break. They're easy to build and they're easy to break. And if we're going to apply this scripture to our relationships, I'm, I just want to speak candidly tonight. I think a lot of us are tempted to build our relationships, not even just our relationships. We're tempted to build our lives 
on sand that's shifting and moving and fleeting and we're building on the wrong foundation where Jesus would say, you don't build your life and your relationship and your future marriage and covenant friendships and everything you do. You don't build it on sand. You build that on a sturdy foundation, the rock. And he says, the rock represents me and my word. Me and my word. If you're going to build on the right foundation, you're going to build your relationship on the person of Jesus and the words of Jesus. Because that's the strong, sturdy foundation that he's laying for us, not the sands. In fact, I have an illustration. I want to bring, bring this out. And I want to make this clear that sandcastles, they're easy to build, but, but they're easy to break. Sandcastles don't last. It doesn't matter how intricate how amazing, Rob, I need you to stay up here. doesn't matter how amazing, how intricate, how big, how beautiful, how much time someone put into a sandcastle. It doesn't matter because what happens? The tide's going to come and wash it away. The rains are going to fall and it's not going to stand. Someone's going to come over and kick it and, and, and it's going to topple over. Why? Because it's built on the sand. The sand is not a good foundation. Really, Jesus is speaking to foundations. He's speaking to foundations. All right, I have power tools, so y'all are really nervous, but I promise you, I've been using a drill a little bit more in my home, so getting, getting the hang of some drills. We, we've got two beautiful birdhouses. How, how awesome. Look how cute these little doors are. You got the little doorknob. You got some three windows. You got a little thing up here, and man, it's just so cute. And, and, and here's the deal. A lot of us, we're trying to build our lives, our homes, our, our relationships, our friendships. We're trying to build them on sand. We're trying to build them on the wrong foundation. And so if you could just hold the top of that. So, so here, we're, here we're trying to build it. We're, we're trying to drill this thing in. We're trying to, you know, make it sturdy, make it strong. We're trying to fortify our, 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 our house that's built on the sand. We spend time doing it. We invest in it. We, we work hard for it. We're, we're, we're trying to, to, to structure it the right way. But what we have to know is either way we're building with, on the wrong foundation. Okay, um, Rob, just, just hold the top over here. So, so here we got a, a sturdy foundation. This is going to represent the rock. The, the, this is going to represent following Jesus, knowing him, listening to him, spending time with him, centering all of us around his word and what he's saying to us. So we're, we're building our lives. We're building our lifestyle. We're building all of that, which we do, everything we say, the way we treat people, the way we love people, the way we serve people. We're, we're doing that based on, give me a second, him and his word. You won't take that? You, you, you got that? You good with that? All right. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. Notice Jesus doesn't, he doesn't say, if a storm comes. He doesn't say, if rain falls. He doesn't say, if winds blow. He says, when they do. Anybody encouraged tonight? Here's the deal. I, I'm not prophesying this over your life. It's just, it's just what happens in life. Difficulties come. Financial crises come. Breakups come. Hard trials come. A diagnosis comes. Things just happen because we live in a broken, corrupt, sinful world. And so what happens is Jesus is trying to give us the foundation for a life that we can, we can persevere through and endure through. But we're, a lot of us, were building on sand. So here's what happens is, is a wind blows and, and rains fall and a storm comes. And check this out. I'm going to use the same pressure for both. And here's what happens to this house built on the sand. It doesn't last. It topples over because it, it's on the wrong foundation. Look at this house though, ready? Lord Jesus, please stay up here. Ready? This house is standing, ladies and gentlemen. Why is this house standing? Because it's not built on sand. 
It's built on the word of God. It's built on the person of Jesus. It's built on the love of Jesus, on the grace of Jesus, on the doctrine of Jesus, on the words of Jesus, on the strength of Jesus, on the peace of Jesus, on the joy of Jesus, shall I continue, on the mercy of Jesus, on the forgiveness of Jesus. It's built on the sturdy, strong foundation. Therefore, when the storm comes, it's strong enough to prevail and persevere and endure and continue forward and I don't know about you but I want my, my my marriage to be built on the right foundation anybody else I want to build on the right foundation it's interesting the same screws the same drill the the same material the same house different foundation and, and here's what Jesus is saying he's saying the foundation is what matters the most So this begs the question for our night. What is your foundation? What is your foundation? In fact, I want to jump into some some things that might be markers for us to help us identify where we are. Maybe, maybe, Maybe we're building my relationship on the sand. If I could get that on the screen, you might be building a a sandcastle relationship. But we have to build rock relationships. Sandcastle relationships don't last. They don't stand the test of time. They don't stand trials. But rock relationships, they're going to last. If you could advance this, the, the, the slide. Uh, check this out. You know you're building a sandcastle relationship when you're listening to the voices of many. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't have good, godly, wise counsel in your relationship. Dear Lord, you need that. You need that so much. Okay, so I'm not saying don't invite the voices of wise mentors and people that, have, that, have, that are just, you're aspiring to be like. But what I am saying is that there's a lot of competing voices for our lives. I mean, we got our, our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, our uncles, our, our, our friends, our peers, our classmates, our, our co-workers, our moms, sisters, uncles, dogs, cats, brothers, sister. We've got so many, so many competing voices. But you know you're building a rock relationship when you're listening to the voice of the one. When the voice of Jesus takes precedence. When the the words of God through time in his word and prayer takes the priority of your life, you know you're building your relationship on the rock, not just many voices. You know, you can go to a stadium. If I can get this, if I can get this removed, that'd be awesome. Thank you. So come on, give it up for these guys who are amazing. You could go to the largest stadium, the largest stadium for, you could go to Gillette Stadium to watch the Patriots play. And, And you could, you could, be in the stands and there's, there's tens of thousands of people all across the stands. And when there's so many voices, it's hard to hear the person that's on your right or left when you're in a stadium like that. But you could go to the same stadium on a different night when it's completely emptied out. Not a soul is in the place. Two people could go there, stand on complete opposite ends of the stadium, and you could speak with a regular voice, and you would be able to hear them clear as day. Why is this? It's because it was emptied out of all the other voices. If you're like, I can't hear God. I don't have a relationship like, like with God like you do. You say the Holy Spirit talks to you and guides you and leads you. I don't have that for me. What is different? I'm just trying to say this. It's when we eliminate the voices that are competing for our time and attention that we can hear the voice of the one that makes our life and changes everything, the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we have to get rid of the weapons of mass distraction. The weapons of mass distraction that are competing for our attention 24-7. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We we are a distracted generation, but if we're going to build our lives, listen to me, if we're going to build our lives and our relationships on a rock, a sturdy, strong foundation, we're going to listen to the voice of the one. We're going to pay attention to the words of Jesus. We're going to build our lives off of what he says because what he says goes. Come on, someone. What Jesus says is what I'm doing. I'm going to follow him. He says that. I'm going that way. He says here. I'm going here. What Jesus says goes. Come on, someone. Say amen in the room. Get a little bit loud and rowdy tonight. The second one, the second way that we can know is that pressure, you know you're building a sandcastle relationship when pressure turns into paralysis. Okay, when pressure turns into paralysis. Jesus says when the storms come, a reminder, not if 
the storms come. The, stu- the two different stories have the same circumstances, yet one stands. The same materials, the same things, the same screws, the same drill, but one stands and one falls. I, I think so often what happens in, in young people, I'll be quick with this one, is that is pressure comes. Arguments break out. We, we have a sharp disagreement. We, 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 something, something happens that we didn't like. Something was said that we don't like. And, and, and we get bitter. And we get cold. And we get hard. And we, we, we get isolated. But here's what I'm telling you. The more bitter, the more cold, the more hard your heart gets, the more paralyzed you really are. You're actually paralyzed. You can't move forward. You can't move. You can't do something great for the kingdom because you're allowing bitterness to hold you back from where God wants to take you. You're paralyzed. Pressure has turned into paralysis. But I'm saying something on the contrary. I believe when your life is built on the rock, pressure actually turns into peace. When you, when you face something head on, although you don't like it, although it's hard, although it's difficult, but you face it, Nonetheless, like a woman of God and a man of God, I believe the things that, are, that are, are, are pressing and causing pressure, I believe those things can actually be the, the way, the pathway to a peace-filled life. I remember um, recently, my, my son Winston, he was, he was sick at night, and so we, we didn't know what to do. We were calling the doctor, and we said, hey, um, th- this is what's going on with our son Winston. We're like, what should we do? And they said, Hey, to be honest, you should probably take him to the hospital. And, and it, we were worried. We were like nervous that it, that it could be COVID. We were nervous that it could be something else. And so we were like, oh, let's go, to the, let's go to the hospital. So Stace and I, we get Winston ready. We have someone that comes over to watch Lena. We jump in the car. And, and I'm telling you, this is in the middle of a snowstorm. Okay? So pressure, Winston's sick. Pressure, snowstorm, pressure. Caleb driving in the middle of a snowstorm with my son in the back and my wife in the passenger seat. And I'm driving like this. And I, my, my windshield wipers, for lack of a better term, they, they, they stink, I'll say. They're horrible windshield wipers. So I'm like barely seeing anything. I'm trying to get my son to the hospital. And, and we're just under pressure. Honestly, I'm anxious. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I'm trying to drive a car in the middle of a snowstorm. And, and, and I don't know what it is about ladies I don't know if, if like there's a, there's like a training center for young girls where every, where you train these, I don't know if the mother's giving advice to, to little girls and saying, when you get married one day, every single time your husband's driving in the car, control him. Tell him every turn he needs to take. Tell him every stop sign he needs to stop at. Tell him what to do at every single light. Even if the GPS is on, tell him which right turn, left turn to take. I don't know what it is about ladies, but all y'all do the same exact thing. I promise you there's a boot camp for young girls that teach how to control men when they're driving. Pressure, pressure, pressure. So Stacy is kindly offering wisdom. She's kindly offering, you know, encouragement in how I'm driving. And she doesn't do it once. She doesn't do it twice. She's consistently offering me wise counsel as I'm behind the wheel. Now, if you're a married couple, you know, in this circumstance, it's about to go down. So we, we got in a... a we got in a, we had a conversation, and the conversation was quite loud, and I, and, I, and I may or may not have said something like this in the midst of our conversation. I may or may not have said it, but I may have, and I said something like this to her. I said, Stacy, I wish I had a mute button for you right now. If you married, you know something. It's about to go down. So guess what she did? She didn't talk the rest of the night. And I was like, oh, dang. When your wife is silent, oh, pressure, pressure, pressure. That could have turned itself into paralysis. But I thank God the next day I got together with my, with my dad, my pastor, my, and an elder. And I, and I was like, listen, um, my wife and I, we got in an argument. I was in the wrong. She's pretty much always right. I was in the wrong, 
And um, I, I may or may not have said, I wish I had a mute button for you. And we, we talked, and, and I, I came home, and Stace and I, we were like, I'm like, babe, I am so sorry. I, and I said this, I, I said, I promise you I'll never say, I, w- I wish I had a mute button for you again. I, I promised her right there, I promise you I'll never say that again. And, and so here's what I'm trying to get to. My wife and I, we, we were able to come to a place of peace Although there was pressure, because we, we, we went head, we, we dove into the pressure, we, we embraced the pressure, and it, all it did was lead to a greater pre- peace in our marriage. Come on, somebody say amen. I mean, that's, that's the Holy Spirit when a husband's apologizing to it. Come on, give me some credit of the work of the Lord in my heart. Come on, give it up for Stacy. She's absolutely amazing. I did not tell her I was going to share that story, so we'll see if it's about to go down later. Um, Pressure turns into peace. Let's, let's check out the next, the next thing as I, as I bring this to a close. Um, our, our sandcastle relationships, you, you seek validation. Listen, you seek validation, and it, and it comes from the one you are with. What I mean by that is your validation only comes from the one that you're dating, the one that you're currently with, the one that's around you. You're seeking validation from, from that person. Your, your source of affirmation and approval and validation, it's coming from the one you're with, But I would say when you're building your life on the rock, your identity comes from the one who is always with you, namely Jesus Christ. He's always with you. He said, I'll never leave you, nor will I abandon you. I'm always with you and I'm always for you. Here's the deal. When we build our lives on sand, we're we're seeking validation from everyone and everyone, everyone and anything, especially our boyfriends and our girlfriends. And I'm telling you this, if that's the source of your validation, then it's all up to how the relationship is going. So you're going to feel crushed and defeated and discouraged and hurt when the relationship isn't going well. And you're going to feel on top of the moon and like everything's amazing when it's going good. It's a shaky foundation. It's not the foundation of the word of God. Listen to this. Who or where you receive validation the most is where you place your own identity in. Who, who you're getting validation from the most is also where you, are, where you are identifying with. I'm a preacher. If I only, if, if, I, if all my validation solely came from people saying, hey, great message. Hey, that was great, Pastor Kid. Hey, good work. Hey, then, then I would feel great. But the second feedback comes, the second criticism comes, the second someone disagrees with me theologically, the second someone someone says something to me that I don't like, I'm crushed and I'm defeated. I am grateful to say to you, my validation doesn't come from what people say of me or what people think of me or wonder what that person's thinking. It comes from the sturdy foundation of the word of Jesus who says, son, daughter, I love you. I love you. If we could have the worship team come, come on out. Son, daughter, I I love you, and I'll lay down my life for you. Lean on FaceTime real quick. A couple couple weeks, a couple months ago, she FaceTimed me, and and I love getting FaceTimes from my daughter when I'm working, and I just, I'll take, I don't care, I don't care if I'm in the most important meeting in the world. I don't care if I'm sitting down with the president. If if, if I know Stacey's FaceTiming me and Lena's going to be on this, um, hold on, Mr. President, I'm sorry. And I'll, I'll be answering that phone, that FaceTime. But she, so I, I did that. We were, in a, we were just closing the staff meeting, and, and I got a, a FaceTime from Stace. So I pulled out the phone up. And I, I answered. There's Lena on the other side. And I'm ecstatic. I'm like, hey, 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 Lena, how are you? How are you doing? And she looks at me, and this is what she says. She says, can I see James? And I was like, oh, you want to see James? You want to see James? And honestly, he's right there. And um, he was fired immediately from his internship that he was doing from. I'm just kidding. But, and, and I was like, hey, 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 um, I'm sorry. James isn't in the room right now. So she said, looking at her dad, she said, can I see anybody? And I was like, are you kidding me? I, hang up the phone right now. No. She said, can I see anyone? And, I, and I'm like, I know it's petty, and I'm, and I'm like talking about this. But here's the deal. I think so often our father has his attention on us. Our Father in heaven's like, son, daughter, you are my beloved. I love you so much. I want to spend time with you. My arms are wide open. And we're going, can I see anybody else? Hey, hey, what about that guy? What about that girl over there? She looks fine. Hey, can I, can, is there anybody else, God? Anybody? And God's like, I'm, I'm here. My arms are wide open for you. I love you so much. 
I'll give everything to spend time with you. I'll, I, I want to build a relationship with you. I love you. I sent my son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. I, I simply want to know you, and I want you to know me. These are the words of Jesus when he says, he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, he says, whoever hears, someone shout hear. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who's built his house on a rock. Listen, 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 listen. Are we getting rid of distractions enough in our life to listen, to draw near to God and his word? So that we can hear the words of Jesus that are calling out to us. Are we able to even, are there so many competing things that we aren't able to hear the words of Jesus as he tells us about his love and his forgiveness and his truth and his call and the things that he wants us to step into and the purpose that he has for our life and the amazing things that we would accomplish if we would just hear the words of Jesus. Then he goes on to say this, whoever hears them and does them will be like a wise man building his house on the rock. We have to hear and we have to step into the do. James says, hear, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. And, and, and the first thing, Jesus, the first thing, one of the, the first thing that we need to know of what Jesus is trying to say to us is this, son, daughter, I love you. I want a relationship with you. I went to the cross for your sin. I hung on that cross. I bled. I was beat. I was mocked. I was tortured. It was, it was a horrible pain, but not only that, it was a pain because I, I absorbed your sin. I was, he was perfect, up, and he was, he was all the way through and through perfect, and he absorbed the sin of mankind as he hung on that cross. He went to the tomb for three days. What we know is Easter. He came, up, he, he came out of that grave a resurrected king. Why? Just so he could prove his love for you and for myself his love is accessible tonight. And the first thing he's asking you to do is will you believe in me? Will you believe in me? Will you call me your Lord and Savior? And I'm wondering if there's people tonight in this space, if you're saying, I want to believe in Jesus. I want to build not just my relationship, I want to build my life on the rock that is him. If that's you, you're saying, I want to believe in Jesus Christ. Would you just raise your hand in this moment? I just want to be able to see you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Is there anybody else in this room you're saying, I want, I want Jesus for the first time. I want Jesus. Anybody else in this room? You want to put your faith in him, put your trust in him. Beautiful. Now here's the second thing I want to say to us. The Bible says that, that we're, 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 he says, whoever hears and does what I tell them, who puts it into practice, now, I think a lot of us in the room, we, we, we could be Christians. We're, we're trying to live this, this faith journey out. We're trying our best. But maybe some of us, we're, we're building our life on the sand. We're building on the validation of others. We're building on, on how, how good I can look on Instagram, how cool I can be in front of my friends, and how impressive I can seem. We're building on the wrong foundation. We're building on the foundation that, hey, if I could just get in that relationship, if I could, if I could just get that job, if I could just get that money, if I could just, you know, have that, have that thing over there, if I could just, and Jesus is like, would you stop? And would you enter a relationship with me again? Would you build your life on the right foundation? That's my question tonight is would you build your life on the right foundation? Let's all stand together in this moment. Let's all stand together. As the worship team prepares to sing a song that's declaring over our lives, I will build my life upon your love that's you you're saying tonight I want to build my life I don't care if you've been a Christian for all your as, as long as you can remember I don't care if, to, if tonight was the first the first thing you've experienced about faith I don't know what it is for you but you're saying I want to build my life on the rock that is Jesus if that's you come down to this altar right now come down to this altar just do your best to spread but come down to this altar if that's you I want to build my life on the person of Jesus on the rock of his word on on his sturdy foundation if that's you just come come down to this altar just fill this place if that's you come forward come forward worship team let's get ready to sing father I pray right now 
that every one of us, we would receive the call of God to pursue the kingdom, to pursue not just our desires, but to pursue the desires of the king of the kingdom. For Father, help us to see your love. Help us to see the calling you placed on our lives. Help us to see the purpose that you have for us. We pray that we would build our lives on your love, on your name, and on your word.